today what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about ticks. And a lot of you may already know what I tell you, but if you don't, then it'll help you understand the tick a little bit. And then I'd like to um, tell you about what can happen if you're bitten by a tick from the point of view of developing allergies. Then I'd like to keep you all safe by showing you how to prevent and manage tick bites. And after that, I'd like to tell you why it's such a fascination for people, for immunologists around the world and for allergic diseases physicians. It's just allergy in a kit. How to get it and how to lose it. And there's nothing else like it allergically on the planet. So I hope you enjoy it this morning. Now ticks in Australia, throughout the world there are about 800 different species. And in Australia we have around 70 species of tick. And 16 of them are out for our blood, literally. 95% uh, of the bites that humans are given, however, from ticks are due to a single species called Ixodes holocyclus. And Ixodes holocyclus is known as the Australian paralysis tick. That's its official common name. Now it's a busy little tick. It likes to inhabit everywhere along the east coast from above Cooktown as you can see across to Normanton down, right down the coast and uh, down to Lake's entrance in Victoria. So. Okay. Is that better? Up the back? Right. Yes. So this, this tick you can find anywhere in this area that's shaded in green. So you can see if you wander west of the divide, you can have problems around Armadale, you can have problems around Canberra. And if you cross to our uh, Tasmanian island, then you can have problems around um, Launceston as well, uh, because this tick is in those spots. And all down the East Coast, the reason that it hugs the East Coast is that it loves humidity. It's there because it's nice and moist. And if we dry a tick out, it perishes. And their mothers put little drops of sunscreen on the babies so that they survive. All 2,000 to 3,000 of them, so it's rather a big effort, I think. <laughs> it makes me feel totally slack in regard to what I've done for my children. <laughs> so this is a picture of an engorged tick. So I don't like to really say this to the ladies in the audience, but she is the problem. Because we're only bitten by uh, female ticks. The male tick, however, it'll make many of the men uncomfortable in the audience to know that the male tick gets its blood feed by just drilling into the female's shell. So it's quite a story already, isn't it? <laughs> this is the life cycle, as you can see. So it starts out with the two to 3,000 eggs, and then uh, it becomes the larval stage, which has got six little legs. And then another blood feed later, later, and it's a nymph, and the nymphs are commonly called grass ticks, as most of you all know. Then it goes on to the adult, usually in spring. But any one of these types of ticks can be found at any time throughout the year. So I've had adults bitten when, uh, uh, by adult ticks when they should have been bitten by a larval tick, and vice versa. Now you can see over on the right, the female's on the left of those two large ticks on the top. And she has that hypostome or feeding tube out the front and the palps to sort of make it uh, settle on the skin, just like you see with a crane and they jack it up a bit. The palps hold the hypostome in place. On the other side, you can see the male on the right doesn't need as long a hypostome because he doesn't have to go through human skin. He just has to find his woman and his right, you see, like most men in life. <laughs> so now we'll move on to allergic conditions caused by the ticks and, and vice versa, I might add. So allergic conditions caused by the ticks 
the least problematic from the point of view of your immunologist and allergist worrying about you is to have a large local reaction. The most troublesome for a lot of people is that large local reaction. So people can have a tick bite and it can swell and that swelling can go from here down to here, half their torso. Normally they're a bit more restrained and it's about five by five centimetres, that sort of size of woody, red, itchy, burning uh, skin, which often people think might be infective, so you generally score some antibiotics to try and take care of that as well. Now more worrying for us is the fact that the tick is a very peculiar creature in that it is so good at causing allergy in people. It literally changes your immune system to do that. It renders your immune system prone to allergy. In other words, it can flick you into being what we call a Th2 or a T cell helper cell type 2 predominant person. Even if you didn't mean to be, you can be made such. And there's an animal model of this. Now, what can happen to, well, hundreds of people that I've seen, I've only seen four this week, uh, in two days of seeing people, uh, the tick bites you, it injects into you, and people make an allergic response to the proteins, one of the proteins in the tick saliva. And the next time they're bitten, when they disturb that tick, scratch it out, pull it out, use something from the vets, otherwise disturb the tick, they have an, an anaphylaxis. And these are profound anaphylaxis. The thing about tick anaphylaxis is it preferentially likes mature people. Most people are over 50. And it gives people a very profound anaphylaxis. We rate it from a grade one through to a grade four, with, with grade four being, well, we hope everything's up to date in your will because you might not make it. And these people have grade three or grade four reactions quite typically, so it's very worrying. Totally preventable, I'm pleased to say, though. Now, mammalian meat anaphylaxis. This is the entity that has grasped the imagination of allergic diseases people around the world. So the strange thing about this is that normally, as you know, we all tolerate mammalian meat. We may choose not to eat it, but we all tolerate it. And that's because it's a good source of protein. It'd be a shame if we didn't because we build bodies with protein. Great source of iron, etc. But I won't take over where the Meat and Livestock Corporation could take you and give an, uh, an advertisement for mammalian meat. But we're tolerant of it. But we lose our tolerance of, to that after a tick bite. Not everybody. This happens in a group of people who are prone to this occurring, but the mechanism will be that the tick provokes or promotes allergy proneness, and then we lose our tolerance to the meat, and then that follows on tick bites. It's usually a month or more after. It can be years after. And what happens then is that when somebody has their steak or their pork chop or whatever, at about seven o'clock at night, they wake up in the middle of the night having what I call a drop-down drag -em out anaphylaxis. In other words, you have to call triple O, they collapse in the bathroom, and it's really quite a severe anaphylaxis again, often. So these two things are quite dangerous. I've seen over 600 people with mammalian meat anaphylaxis over the last 10 years or so. I see on average one or two people each week. Again, what I think is a preventable allergy. So that's our thrust, to prevent it. The large local reactions, I know we're missing an arm here. Normally we have a big fat arm, it might come up in a while, maybe if I press again, the arm will appear. I'm an experiential learner, as you've guessed. So you can see that huge reaction there to the tick bite, and you can see two tick bites. That's the sort of thing a large local reaction is, quite enormous, really. It's all inflammation, it's all due to allergy, and it's all making a big mess of the arm. So, as I said, you often get antibiotics for it, and usually a tetanus shot as well. So, least, of, least problematic from the point of view of survival of the sufferer, but quite a problem. 
They don't start until four to 12 hours after the bite because you have to gather your immunological brigade to do the inflammation, draw them in through the blood vessels, line them up, orchestrate the reaction, and then go for it with the inflammation. And then they take at least 10 days to resolve and typically no after effects, as you can see. You look back on that arm in, in two weeks' time, you wouldn't know that that had been there. They occur with lots of insects, bees, wasps, mosquitoes, midges, you name it. You can have March flies, you can have a large local reaction to them. And probably that relates to the fact that those creatures are injecting a little something into us. Now, the tick-induced anaphylaxis is no different to, apart from the fact that it's usually more severe, it's no different to anaphylaxis, which is severe, from any other cause, peanut or prawn or blueberry or apple or pear or any of the things that I've seen, tomato, strawberry, you name it, I'm sure we've seen it. And if I haven't, as I say to my patients, that's why I keep turning up, because there's something new every week. So generalised itch is often the first thing. A feeling of warmth goes through the body. People feel as though they've been injected. And the important thing about this is it doesn't happen until you disturb the tick. If you leave that tick there, it could drop off having had its blood feed and you would have no problem with it. So it's when it injects you because it's been disturbed. So it's a very nice thing, a tick, if you think about it. When it hops on, it races up about four hours it takes it to reach your hairline, which is what's, what it's aiming for, and then it gives you a little bit of local anaesthetic and digs in with the hypostome. And that's, that sounds very kindly of the tick. In actual fact, the tick doesn't want you to know it's there, so it's purely a survival mechanism to give you the local anaesthetic. Then it puts its anticoagulant in because it wants its blood lake because these are what we call telophagous feeders or blood lake feeders. Not like the mosquito. The mosquito just goes in, zaps the tiniest of little veins called a venule and then whizzes off. And, but this lady needs a lot of protein to make her 3,000 babies, so she needs a big lake of blood. The urticarial welts may come up all over the person. Breathing difficulty, the throat can close. A lot of people have a feeling of impending doom, basically because it, there is impending doom. <laughs> and nature has wired us to pick up on this in case there's something we can run away from to fix the problem. Uh, dizziness, which portends collapse. In other words, your cardiovascular system just goes whoosh and every bit of blood goes into what we call the periphery or your skin and things like that. So you lose your blood pressure to the head, and again, nature organises it so that at that point you fall over, so you get some blood to the head when you lie down, and you can think your way out of the problem. That's my sort of anthropomorphic sense of science. You're probably outraging Rob and Stuart down here, but we'll, <laughs> we'll find out about that later. And some people even lose consciousness. So. Generally, I think, you, I think it's important to appreciate this. You see, they're rarely fatal. There have been two fatalities of which I'm aware. None of them my patients, I'm pleased to say. Um, two, people, two men in Queensland, and uh, they awakened at night and disturbed a tick and then had a fatal anaphylaxis. Now, the life-threatening reactions are much more common than we see to anything else. For every, from 2011 to 2013, I would see one paper wasp uh, sting, one European wasp sting that had caused anaphylaxis, two bee stings, but 49 people with tick anaphylaxis. They would be the ratios. So that's extraordinary when you consider that bee venom is considered to be reasonably common as a venom allergy, for example. Obviously, it's uh, more common than a shark attack or being struck by lightning as well. So that doesn't mean we'll go out and put our umbrella up, of course. But with tick anaphylaxis, this is what I was talking to you about earlier. I looked at 78 of our people and found that uh, more than half are over 50. More than almost 20% are over 70. And that may relate to how many people have time for gardening. But I don't think so, because we get a lot of other people who are gardening or a lot of people who are walking through their 
leaf litter backyard to put the clothing out or to bring the clothing in. So I think it actually is a situation where our mature people are particularly attractive to them. And the male to female ratio is pretty close, but a slight preponderance to, for the men. And then again, that might mean that the men are out there doing a bit more of the sort of shifting the leaf litter, etc. Now, this association between tick bites and mammalian meat allergy was first described in 2007 because it was getting dangerous. I was seeing too many people. Like most clinicians, we have to be prodded into writing things up. And so I thought, this is a bit dangerous. There are probably people all along the East Coast who need to know about this. And so I wrote it up as an abstract, which was published online in November this month, actually seven years ago. Now, we're very lucky with this because the Americans picked up on it. And Tom Platts Mills is a fellow who's researched allergy for all his life. And he's been made a fellow of the Royal Society for his work on dust mite. In actual fact, he took an interest in this from a different aspect. They had people who were having terrible allergic reactions, again, grade three, grade four anaphylaxis to a, um, an oncology agent for colon and head and neck cancer. And they just had a 10% of people would have a really nasty reaction. And we've had a death here in Australia from it in these people who are mammalian meat positive because it's actually cross-reacting. The alpha-gal or the little part of the molecule that people are allergic to is in that oncology drug and it's administered a whack of it intravenously and that's an excellent way, unfortunately, to, um, to provoke a, a life-threatening reaction. So we're very lucky to know that the actual little bit of the meat that people react to is two sugar molecules or galactose molecules stuck together by an enzyme that the human no longer has. The great ape no longer has it, and the old world monkey no longer has it. So technically, these are the only meat our allergic people, our mammalian meat people uh, who are allergic to the alpha gal can eat. So it's either illegal, immoral, or hard to get. So it's it's rare that carbohydrates cause anaphylaxis. We get them in plants and things like that, but usually the, the allergens that cause anaphylaxis are protein in nature. So this is a curious allergen and a curious cause of the allergy and a very common problem where I practice. So mammalian meat allergy, if you said to me, how many people do you see with mammalian meat allergy that haven't been bitten by a tick? I can number it on the fingers of no fingers, okay? None. Sometimes you see a little child who's meat allergic because they're intensely cow's milk allergic. And that occurs, and I've seen two or three of those, but that's it. So it doesn't happen unless the tick has bitten someone for practical purposes. The tick bite, of course, comes before the mammalian meat allergy because it has to condition the person to be allergic. And often they've had a little reaction to the tick bite in the past. Whoops. Now, often there's several months before it starts. Uh, it's typically delayed. So this is one of the difficulties, you see, because when you've got a protein allergy that's, uh, allergen that's causing an anaphylaxis, it's always naught to 30 minutes. Prawn can be two hours, egg can be two hours, but that's quite unusual even in those allergens. So this is quite odd. And the reason for that, it has to be metabolized and then come up through the lymph gl glands and the lymph vessels and then get dumped back into your veins at the level of the heart and go around again. And so this is why it takes quite a while. Of course, the amplifying factors for all allergies still are in, in, uh, in force. I always say to people, if you really want to know how allergic you are to your prawn or your peanut, then what you do is you stuff yourself with it, you have it with chili, you have it heavily cooked if it's peanut and lightly cooked if it's any other allergen, you walk to the restaurant or run around the block, you have a headache tablet the day before, and you um, uh, be slightly unwell if you possibly can at the same time, and then you'll know how big a reaction you can have. Because all of those factors are tipping points for having an anaphylaxis or not having an anaphylaxis. And that's one of the reasons that allergy has this um, flavor of being difficult to understand. It's not, it just follows these rules. 
of certain things making it more likely that you'll react or not react. So, now this last line here is very important. Around the world, the commonest, call, the commonest reason for an adult carrying an EpiPen for anaphylaxis to a food is peanut allergy. And where the tick is, and the people who live in high, what I call hyperendemic areas like the northern beaches, then that it, it exceeds that. It's actually 0.12%, so it's more common than the commonest allergy needing an EpiPen. Now, the prevention of tick-induced allergies is really the prevention and management of tick bites. These allergens, to my view, are preventable. I look forward to the day when the efforts of Tiara, the tick-induced allergies research and awareness outfit and everything that we're doing means that I sit back and wonder why I haven't seen somebody with that for a month. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, as I said. So, now we'll go into the importance of the prevention of tick bites. So tick anaphylaxis is very rare outside Australia. There's one case in North America. There are a few people in Spain. Uh, there are you know, a couple of people around the world, but it's really rare. And it might relate to the fact that the tick, our tick's feeding tube is the longest of all ticks. So it might get a better go at uh, injecting what it has to change us. Uh, in Australia, we've got the, very likely the highest prevalence of the mammalian meat allergy. Uh, in the southeastern United States, it's very common, and they estimate that they have 5,000 people, which is more people than we have, but their rate is 1 in 8,000, whereas our rate here is about 1 in, one in 880 when I think about the number of people who live where I live and the number of people I and my colleagues have seen with the problem. So there's some evidence from the US with their different tick, Amblyoma americanum, that if they don't get tick bites, then you might lose your mammalian meat allergy because the, the immune system is always trying to fix it. It's always trying. So for example, if you're penicillin allergic, one month after you have your reaction, you'll be positive to, on the skin or the blood or both. 10 years later, only 10% of people will be. Those 10%, unfortunately, might go off like a bomb, so we generally tell you to keep avoiding it. So it's trying to get back to neutral, and if we don't have a tick bite, then we might get back to it in 90% of instances would be reasonable. And there are certainly, I spoke to a woman last week who that had happened to, she'd had tick bites here, developed mammalian meat allergy, went to Europe, didn't get tick bites in Europe, lost the mammalian meat allergy, doesn't live in a tick prone area and remains free of her mammalian meat allergy. Obviously she needs to move back to the northern beaches to be scientific about it <laughs> and see if she can get it again and lose it again, but she's been loath to do so for some reason. <laughs> the other part is the importance of the appropriate management of tick bites and the treatment of tick induced allergies. So with the anaphylaxis we had a look at 78 people, 65 of them could tell us the, a complete story. And what we saw was, as I said, the anaphylaxis is so much more likely to be more severe. 75% virtually have a, a really nasty anaphylaxis. Everybody who killed the tick where it was didn't have an anaphylaxis after we made this diagnosis. Tick removal technique was known in 65. Everybody either pulled it out, used the household tweezers, scratched it out, disturbed it while they're awake, disturbed it while they're asleep, disturbed it in the shower because they didn't realize they had a tick on their back, or used something from the vet. So potentially avoidable in really uh, the, major the vast majority of instances, I believe. So I'll go on from that. So the Australasian Society, these are our 2014 recommendations and they will be our 2015 recommendations as well. Uh, kill the tick where it is, use an ether containing spray to freeze it because it's dead immediately then. Uh, wait for the tick to drop off or remove it without compressing it. You see, you can still t kill the tick, and it's like a bee. If you've got a dead bee, you can still sting yourself, can't you, by squashing your foot onto that bee. Almost everybody in the room's probably done that. 
Do it in a safe setting. If you um, if you've had a, an allergic reaction before, take yourself up to the emergency department. But do it yourself when you get there, so you know you can do it. And use a ticocide, which is used for scabies generally, called Lyclear or permethrin cream, to kill the little ones that uh, that you see, because it's really hard to sort of zap them accurately, and you can't sort of zap something that freezes your skin. 40 times because you might burn your skin with the ether spray. So it comes down to three easy things to remember. For a larval or nymph stage tick, dab it, don't grab it. Use the permethrin cream. For an adult tick, freeze it, don't squeeze it. Use the ether spray. And then the other thing to remember is household tweezers are tick squeezers. So they will squeeze the allergen into you and it, that is not a good idea, as we've <laughs> heard this morning. Now, common advice about tick removal has been fine tip tweezers. Now, they will work provided you get right under and you take it up. But a lot of people have told me, remember the demographic that the tick anaphylaxis favours? And a lot of my patients said, said to me, my husband or my wife can't see to use the, the fine tip forceps. They're hard to get. And I think that really they're they're a bit they're not useful to us in in the general run of um, tick removal. Fine in the emergency department, uh, and that's they say grasp the tick, remove it immediately. No, leave the tick in. If you're by yourself, leave the tick in until there's somebody home in case you have an allergic reaction to it. If they're home within 16 hours, you won't get a nasty illness from it either because it doesn't start until the tick's been in for about 16 hours. Rapid removal reduces the risk of infectious disease, yes, but you don't want to get an allergy from it either, so we have to do it when we can, within the time, as I said, 16 hours. Disadvantages to the usual advice is that they're not widely available, they're substituted with household tweezers, which makes the whole thing dangerous, uh, rarely done properly, difficult to achieve in young children, and as I said, eyesight can be a problem not useful for removing the nymphs either, usually the little ones, the two millimetres. So now I'd like to tell you about the significance of the tick-induced allergies, because it's really fascinating that this allergy or allergies, uh, they represent, if you could design a kit to tell you how to make an allergy and lose it too, then this would be, this is perfect. So it's very insightful into what happens in our immune systems. Firstly, the tick bite, as I said, promotes allergy proneness in the host. There's an animal model for that. Maybe it's because the tick's there for a while that that helps, so it's got time to modulate the immune system, unlike the mosquito. The severity of alpha-gal allergy, or that meat allergy, is also of great interest to us. These things are both, both very severe allergies in the majority of people, so this again comes back to the idea that the tick is altering us. And two severe allergies from the one provocation, protein and carbohydrate. And that's probably because the protein presents the carbohydrate, the sugar, the alpha-gal, to the immune system. Ticks inject the allergen. If you want to become allergic to something, injection's best. Mm. Eating it will partly tolerise you because we have this wonderful arrangement in our mouths of um, dendritic cells which will start making you tolerate that substance within 15 minutes. Ticks provide the allergen exposure. Not only do they make you allergic, inject it, they give you the allergen and tell you which allergen you should direct your efforts against. And then uh, the, we're left with the conclusion, aren't we, that if we avoid the promoting factor, and the allergy may remit because that's what allergies do, then there's a role for secondary prevention. In other words, if you've got the problem, maybe not having a tick bite will allow it to go away. But then it, we've got primary prevention possibilities as well, in that if you deal with the tick correctly, then you don't get sensitised to the tick salivary protein and have a tick anaphylaxis, 
and you don't get sensitised or lose your tolerance for the mammalian meat allergen and don't become allergic to mammalian meat. So that's why I sort of term it the how to make an allergy and lose it kit. Now we've set up Tiara as well, which is aimed at promoting awareness and, uh, and that's been a, a wonderful medium with a website to try and get this information out because when we saw on that first slide we see how extensive the area is and those areas do not have uh, an allergic diseases physician on their doorstep. So we've put up the diets that people need, the iron intake advice that they need to make their lives comfortable if they're living in Cairns as one of my patients does or Tambourine Mountain. As long as they can get onto the internet then they can keep themselves safe. And so Thank you for your attention today, and I hope you've enjoyed the morning.